I appreciate uh, being here and, and I'm thrilled to be able to talk about school mental health. I think that is really, uh, and I have for a long time, where mental health services, where we can make the most difference for kids with emotional and behavior problems. I'm not sure we're maximizing our opportunities to do that and I'll tell you a little more about that as we go through, but I think the potential is just incredible and that's what uh, keeps me passionate about this work and excited about doing this. As Bill mentioned, I was a special education teacher in an elementary school before uh, going into clinical psychology. And I entered that uh, p position with the idea as a teacher that this is where we can make the difference. This is where we can do well for kids with learning problems, with emotional behavior problems. And you know, I still remember my first day going into, this, into the school, a big mural on the wall. Uh, it's our goal to make a difference for kids, and I was like, yes, we can do this. And I started to get ideas, I had a lot of ideas about how we can collaborate, how clinical psychologists and psychiatrists and others in the community could come together and we could work to make a difference for kids. And one of the first meetings that I went to uh, regarding an IEP for one of the students who I was working with, the parents brought a clinical psychologist to the meeting and I knew that was going to happen and I was like, see, here's a great example. We can you know, share expertise and talk about how to make a difference for the kid. And the guy came in and he was one of the most arrogant idiots I've ever <laughs> worked with. <laughs> and he told me everything we were doing wrong without ever asking me what we were doing. And he just was so critical and prescriptive about the ways that we have to do things right I left there crushed. That collaboration it isn't all I thought it was going to be. And I wasn't real fond of the field of clinical psychology at that point, given that was my orientation to it. However, I went on to become a clinical psychologist because I think I, I learned so much by the training there, and I think it can work better. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, about how with mental health professionals, educators working across the spectrum and focusing on making a difference at school, we can make differences for kids in a way that is, uh, is not yet even fully realized. So the other thing I want to tell you today is there are, I think there are three keys to being successful in school mental health, to being a successful practitioner and provider and someone working with children. I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the first one. And at the end, I'll share the final two. And uh, hopefully, uh, that'll help put a lot of what I'm going to talk about before together. And the oh, yeah, the remote. OK, good. So school mental health, let me give you first a little just definition of what I mean by that. And the, what I'm going to refer to is direct and indirect services that help students with emotional and behavior problems succeed. And I say, when I say direct, I'm referring to things you typically think of as mental health services, as like counseling or training interventions or remediation or things that we target the student directly. And by indirect, I'm talking about teaching approaches, classroom management, teachers collaborating with a mental health provider on making a difference for a child with anxiety or ADHD or any number of emotional and behavioral problems. And it's actually some of these indirect resources that I think make the school environment so incredibly unique and valuable for making a difference. So I also inter I'm going to use the term school mental health professional a lot. And by that, I'm referring primarily to school counselors, school psychologists, school social workers, intervention specialists, special education teachers, all the people who often are assigned to work with children with emotional and behavioral problems. However, to some degree, everyone in a school can be a school mental health professional because classroom teachers, um, administrators, even uh, cafeteria monitors, uh, so many people can play a role in making a difference for these students and to that extent, all people working in a school have a role as a school mental health practitioner. So let me give you a little background too. Uh, if you look in the literature, there are articles on school mental health dating back to the 1980s typically. The difference prior to the 90s compared with now is in the prior to the 90s, much of it focused on psychoeducation and bullying prevention and things like that. So they were 
whole school culture prevention kind of approaches, responding to crisis, suicide prevention, suicide. And what's different is that uh, in the 90s, what switched is a lot of the, the idea that a lot of care can be given for kids with emotional behavior disorders that used to be provided at clinics can also be provided at schools and potentially in a much more potent and accessible manner. And that's what I'm going to tell you a little more about. So part of the impetus for doing that transition during the 90s was that care, there were lots of problems identified with care at clinics. So most students, and I probably don't have to tell any of you this, most students with emotional behavior problems do not receive care at clinics. And of those who do, typical amount of care is maybe one to two sessions. At, at most, people get uh, uh, up to like six or seven sessions. But if you think of some of the students or children you work with who have multiple emotional and behavioral problems, and you think about even six or seven sessions, what could anyone do in six 50-minute sessions with someone who has a myriad of problems with family challenges and community challenges and problems in the classroom or problems at school? You, you, we need to develop magic, actually, if we're going to be able to make a difference with such small bits of interventions, especially those for those students who have some of the most complex problems. And so in a lot of respects, in the 90s, it was realized that mental health system serving children and adolescents was really failing. We weren't meeting the needs of children with emotional and behavior problems. And so part of what then led to thinking about school mental health services in a more clinic, including a more clinical type of service, was access. So um, what often would happen in schools is you'd have uh, uh, master's level social workers and counselors who would then refer students to clinics where they would be seen by master's level counselors and social workers. And the training that each of these groups of professionals received was very similar. The difference is the counselors and social workers at the schools who made the referral knew that most of the kids would never get to the clinic. But what an inefficient system, right? Why do we have people with the same expertise as the ones at the clinic doing the referring instead of providing some of the services or many of the services? right at the school. So the access issue became one of the real drivers in the 90s of trying to bring the more clinical services back to the, into the school and integrate them. To varying degrees, integrate them. And I'm going to show you about, tell you about that in a minute, too. So in the 90s, there were really two common models of school mental health that emerged. And the first one is school-employed school mental health professionals. And this is the idea I've been talking about, where a school counselor, school social worker, school psychologist, and others actually works in a manner with a student similar to how someone might in a clinic. There are a lot of strengths and advantages to this approach. For example, school counselors and social workers, they already have the relationships with all the staff, with all the students. You can enlist collaboration from your colleagues. You can monitor better in settings by knowing the people who are there with them or by watching. Uh, and any training you provide those school counselors and school social workers is an investment in the school's own resources because they're an employee there. And communication can also be facilitated as a employee of the school district is actually the one providing the services. There are weaknesses, too, and limitations. And these became apparent as we, these kind of models began to emerge in various practices. And part of it, one of them is a lack of a mental health backup. So while many of the services provided at clinics are provided by master's level social workers and master's level uh, counselors, et cetera, there's often at a clinic a backup. So if they don't know what to do, or if there's a crisis or some kind of emergency, there's other people at clinics they can pull in with more expertise in a variety of particular areas. And that doesn't exist in a school. And so that's one of the limitations of the school mental health services. The other one that became um, a point of some discussion at a lot of these uh, 
uh, programs that were developing in the 90s um, in terms of school mental health here was the cultures around confidentiality and record keeping. So when a school mental health professional is working with a student, clinical confidentiality related to things like HIPAA and what, what you can share with people is much different culture and strictness around the rules of that sharing than is typically accepted in or uh, abided by in schools. So it can be, it can put people off when you say, I'm coming here to collaborate, I'm gonna help work with your schools. And then the teacher asks you, so what, is, what are you guys talking about in your sessions with Johnny? And you don't say, I can't really share that. And you'll say, what happened to this openness to collaboration and, and communication and sharing? It was kind of a culture clash between issues some of them around confidentiality and also then about record keeping too. So where do we keep clinical records? And do they stay with the education files? Is there a separate file? Are they equally accessible by others? And those kind of issues were some of the practical things that became a bit problematic as these models were being developed during the 1990s. So the other model, the other one that model that emerged during the 90s too to expand this uh, approach to school mental health was contracting with external agencies. And both these models still exist today. You can find them probably in Miami. Um, and there are strengths to that one too. So if a school contracts with a low school mental health agency to have some number of hours of mental health services provided by one of their clinicians in their school, that is the kind of model that I'm referring to here, and it's actually a fairly common one. So one of the strengths, as opposed to uh, in the, just working with school employed school mental health professionals, is they have mental health backup. And the clinicians can always provide, also provide a connection and facilitate referrals back to the agency for problems that may go beyond what can be handled in a school. So if you're contracting with someone from your local behavior health clinic, things aren't getting any better, and in fact there's serious concerns, that clinician could help facilitate that student and or their parents being seen at the local community clinic for things that aren't typically provided at schools possibly, like medication or other, uh, other uh, addressing other serious problems. There are also weaknesses to that contracted model, for example. A lot of the school counselors, school social workers at mental health clinics don't know schools. Their degree was in community counseling instead of school counseling. So they have a lot, they don't always understand the culture of the school and how to integrate care and how to make care more than just uh, seeing them in, in isolation. So for example, one of the things that often happens in these contracted services that is really not taking advantage of what school mental health can be is called, we refer to as a co-location model where if I'm a co person contracted from a local agency, I come to your school some number of hours a week, you find a little closet where I can work and meet with students, and I sit in that closet the whole time that I'm in the school, and kids come and kids go, and I talk to them individually about their problems. That's a co-location model, and it, it invo it's a failure to really integrate and capitalize on your, the opportunities that mental, school mental health provides in terms of working together. So that's one of the weaknesses of that model. And the, one of the others uh, listed here is costs, uh, because the district often has to pay to bring that person in. Sometimes costs are recovered by billing. So a local, if, especially in a school that has a lot of children with Medicaid, community mental health centers can come in and they can bill for their services for the students that they see, and that helps reduce the cost to the school for their time in the school. The problem is, again, that kind of pushes people towards a co-location model. The other bigger problem is, especially from a, uh, a administrator's point of view, is it limits the kids you can see sometimes if you're too reliant on billing. So if that child has serious problems, but he doesn't have Medicaid, then maybe you can't see him. And they, administrators tend not to be as open to the idea that you can come and work with some of their kids and not others of their kids. So that's a limitation, again, that isn't part of the school employed mental health, school mental health uh, model. 
So anyway, these two models were emerging in the 90s, and there are examples of both that, that uh, were common in a lot of places. And I'm going to focus a little bit more on the school-employed school mental health model. So one of the limitations to the school mental health professionals actually doing mental health work with students in the school was their availability and their time. And that continues to be one of the limitations because, uh, unfortunately, much of their time is spent doing administrative tasks. If, for example, school counselors are often the ones in charge of scheduling at the school. Well, you don't have to have your master's degree in counseling to come up with student schedules. So your uh, schools are overpaying for that work. And you could do that task with administrative staff. There are other things they're often asked to do, report generation, tracking attendance, doing things like that. And part of, I think, the reason why that becomes an obstacle in terms of their time that they can devote to children with emotional behavior problems is they report to an administrator. School counselors, school social workers typically report to the uh, principal of the school whose main job is administrative tasks. And the school counselor becomes someone you can delegate some of those to. And so it helps the administrator accomplish his or her goals if they can uh, recruit some of the people, school mental health professionals, to do some of the things like this. The other thing they're often doing is responding to crisis. And interestingly, when I talked to a school counselor at a middle school not too long ago, he described to me one of, in terms of meeting with students, one of the things that is the most common reason he has to meet with students is girl drama, as he calls it. <laughs> where they come in and who said this about who and they were friends yesterday and that girl I can't trust and tears and and so when you look at the kind of things they're often spend their time doing it's often not meeting the needs of the students with emotional and behavior problems so how are these priorities determined and how maybe if we know that then maybe we can talk about how can we impact them and so we did a survey asking 140 high school counselors to rate the importance of a list of responsibilities according to their priority and their perception of the principal's priority. We didn't ask the principals their priority because that really doesn't matter as much, right? If I'm a school counselor and I think my principal's priority is X and he says it's Y, I'm still going act, to act based on my perception of his or her priorities. So we. Uh, we asked them, and we asked them to rank a variety of activities. And here are the activities we asked them to rank, and they're listed in, according to priority, the left column is counselors' ranking of the services or priorities for their time. The right column is the, their perception of their principal's priorities for their time. Interestingly, they agree with the top two, responding to crises and meeting with parents. They both saw this as something very central to their work and their, their job at the school. After that, it starts changing. So the counselors believe that working with students, essentially, with drop-ins, career counseling, or individual mental health interventions were priorities three, four, and five. Uh, you can see that the administrative tasks are next in the priority list in terms of their perceptions of the with their principal's priorities. they scheduling classes and proctoring standardized tests. Again, both activities that you don't need a master's level professional to do. And if you look at where principals, their perception of principal's priority of providing inter mental health interventions to students, it's at nine. And it may be lower, we only asked about nine things. Uh, but it was at the bottom of the principal's list of priorities for the time the school counselors spent. So this lets us know a little bit about the messages and priorities that counselors are getting. And this was just counselors, so school social workers, intervention specialists, others may, data may be different, but we worked with uh, high school school counselors. And to me, I was, working on one project with a lot of schools across a variety of states. And I looked at the web page of a high school in South Carolina. And 
This just to me characterized the misplacement of priorities. First, the page had this wonderful picture of five school counselors standing together smiling. That's nice, that's not what I perceive to be the problem. However, under that, it said something to the effect of, if you're interested in changing your schedule or planning your courses for next year, please to come to our office during the times listed below. That's nice, nice web page accessibility for scheduling a time or you could drop in or whatever the case may be. Second, if you're interested in learning about colleges or other educational and vocational opportunities, please visit our office to obtain brochures and meet with a counselor about your options. Again, nice invitation for students to um, come and access the resources of their counseling services. Third said, if you're experiencing emotional or behavior problems and wish to receive services, please click here and download a list of local community resources. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? Now I know why the women were all smiling in the picture up top. They weren't doing the hard work. They weren't doing the work that, that uh, is really difficult to do, but I think rewarding and what, we're, and what should be our priority to do. And that's, to me, one of the major obstacles to effective school mental health practices in schools is a misallocation of our resources that are already in our schools. Why, again, why is a school counselor with a master's degree doing scheduling and we contract with a master's degree counselor who comes, does co-located services for 10 hours a week in the school? That makes no sense. I think the, <laughs> thank you. I'm glad to see some of you agree. <laughs> I actually done talks with superintendents and other administrators and I said if you have five school counselors in your school and you want to improve the focus on helping kids with emotional and behavior problems, get rid of one of them. Replace them with an administrator who can take all these other ridiculous responsibilities thereby freeing up the other four to work with the children with emotional behavior problems. You'll save money, and the amount of services that get to children will increase dramatically. We, we need to make a real shift to focus, I think, the expertise we have in the schools to working with the children with emotional and behavior problems. And that partly involves this kind of administrative shift. But I want to say, too, and I, I'm sure many of you have spoken to colleagues who know this, when school counselors, school social workers, others get especially a little ways into their career, it's a lot easier to do these administrative tasks. And some of them choose it. And it may not be as much a direction of their administrator as it's what I do. It's what I'm comfortable with. And it becomes my routine and how I'm going to, uh, to do my work every day. So I, I think it is an administrative problem, but I also think it's a re-energizing school mental health professionals, especially beyond the early point in their career, that this is our priority. This is the group we have to make a difference for and change our focus that way. So I think there's a couple. And part of the reason I think this is because school mental health has such incredible potential to make a difference for kids that can't happen other places. One reason is because, well, there's a few reasons. But if they're done, services are done well, they're far more accessible than a clinic, right? Because most of the kids with problems never get to a clinic, especially children in low SES, parents with less education. They're not the ones who as, are as likely to show up at clinics. In addition, oftentimes their problems are more difficult to impact, and it's harder to make benefit for them where you can do this at a school. Here's some of the reasons I believe that to be the case. We're working in a clinic and you got a new client and you need to figure out what the problem is. Your assessments are largely a function of interviews and rating scales. Occasionally, one of the rating scales might come from a teacher, or, but not always. So you're limited in the perception of the problem, of your understanding of the problem as a clinician by the student's understanding of the problem and by that student's parent's understanding of the problem. And that isn't always accurate. The parent's perception, especially as we move into secondary schools, is often quite limited in terms of what, what is going, what isn't working, what's going wrong, what's their child doing. 
Um, when you're in a school, you don't have that limitation at all. You can observe them in the cafeteria. You can observe them in transitions between classes. You can talk to their teachers. You can observe them in their classrooms. You can see what may provo be provoking certain responses and what may be uh, causing the challenges that this student is having, getting along with other people, controlling his or her own emotions, getting the assignments done that he's supposed to have done in class. You can learn so much more. The environment is so much more rich. There's no setting where we ask more of our children often than at school. And we tax them socially, we tax them behaviorally, and we tax them academically. And if you can see those moments, you're going to know so much more about what the nature of the emotional behavior problems are than if you're entirely based on parent and you self-report and rating scales. Second, I think the richness and the opportunities at school are enhanced by what we can do in treatment. In clinics, they leave. You always wonder whether they're going to come back, because a lot of times parents and their children don't come back. As we saw, they usually have less than six total sessions, often one or two. In schools, you can see them whenever you want. You're not limited to 50-minute sessions if they show up. They have to show up at school, of course. But that's more common than them showing up at clinics. You can see them 10 minutes one day, a half hour the next day, twice for 30 minutes the next week. You can have a much more flexible implementation opportunity of whatever services you're going to have for them. And you can do it over a much longer period of time. There is no need to have a 10 session program. I, I actually think in like in clinics, as we've developed more uh, interventions over time, there's been a real emphasis on shortening the interventions. I can help someone in four sessions. I can help them in three. I can help them in two. And part of the reason is because we're not sure they're going to come to the clinic for the next session. But in a school, you could work with them for months. You could work with them over years. You can do a lot more to impact them over a period of time, which I believe is one of the more important things we need to do to make a difference for them. And that's perfectly within the opportunities for school mental health professionals at school. We can also enlist the support of others. I can talk to a teacher about doing things differently in his or her classroom. I can talk to the parents about things at home. I can, ch I can talk about adjusting their schedule. I can talk to administrators about how to handle the student if he's referred to the office for discipline problems. I can impact this whole context and culture in which that child is having problems in a way that's part of the mental health intervention, part of school mental health. And again, the opportunity to even talk between a clinic, clinician and a clinic and a school is often very challenging, let alone to do it in a way that's as meaningful as I was just describing. I think one of the other things is why is an intervention not working? If i am got a game plan in place and help a student be, uh, learn to do something when he feels a certain way or when he gets agitated or wherever, I can watch. I can see what's interfering with him or her implementing what I've prescribed and practiced and worked on the student to do. At a clinic, you're just going to know it's not working. It's going to be much harder to know why. Your potential to make a difference in the school with looking at why something's working or not working is just, I think, enormously better. So I'm going to tell you, give you two brief examples of what I think are school mental health interventions that really are taking advantage of a lot of these resources that we have. You may, be, may or may not be familiar with some of them. The first one is one that was developed by Hill Walker and a group of his colleagues. You may have heard of First Steps for Success, which is a universal program for young kids, primary grade kids. And they, uh, not too long ago, came out with First Step Next which is a tier two intervention. It's an intervention for individual students who have all kinds of problems. And of course, I uh, give credit where credit's due here. These are Ed Files slides, one of the people who works with Hill Walker on this. And if you're working with primary age kids, you have lots of great cartoons and characters on them, which you won't see on the rest of the slides that I made, but they are here. So this is who First Step Next is for. Just a couple data slides that Ed shared in one of his recent talks about First Step Next and looking at targeting the social skills of uh, 
children with disruptive behavior disorders, externalizing problems according to teacher ratings, as well as parent-teacher conflict in terms of declines there. So we are doing trials on some of these school mental health interventions. First Step Next is a good example, and there's uh, papers published on that. Jumping up in the age group a little bit, uh, in secondary schools for adolescents with ADHD is a Challenging Horizons program, which if you come to the workshop this afternoon, I'll tell you a little more about. Um, it's a program that targets adolescents with ADHD, their academic skills, interpersonal skills, and organization skills. And we just completed a study a few years ago looking at uh, Challenging Horizons program. We did a randomized trial, 326 students with ADHD. I say that sometimes and people go, you had all those kids together in one place? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, we randomized them to the after-school program or a mentoring program or to community care. And uh, I'll tell you a lot more about what's involved with the interventions, but it's a school-based, the after-school program is what I'm going to refer to here mostly. It's met over two hours and 15 minutes twice a week over the course of an academic year. Here's one of the outcomes, and what, uh, I'll share as an example. You see between the bars is the academic year that we treated them. This is a graph of grade point average. And you can see on, at time point two, which was their first report card in the treatment year, they did, they all did, three groups did similarly. After that, those students in the after school program separated themselves from the other two groups. And you can see that by the end of the year of do, uh, doing the after school program, they were significantly better than the other two groups. What was particularly remarkable to us was this, to the right of that, T6 through T9 are the grades in the year after we stopped the program. So they were no longer receiving services. And if you look to the T9, the gap between after school program and anyone else in GPA is greater than it ever was before. This wasn't just a result on grade point average. This was also a result on parents' ratings of organization, homework completion, things like that. If you're familiar with a lot of the psychosocial literature, especially for children and adolescents with ADHD, follow-up uh, results typically are much smaller than end-of-treatment results. The effect sizes are smaller, and the number of variables that still are significantly different are much smaller. So what was particularly unique in these findings was that the gap continues to grow. The other thing that's interesting here, and if you've worked with teens with ADHD, you've probably seen this, is if you look at the after, kids in the after school program, their grades never really get better during that first treatment year. The difference is caused because the other kids' grades get worse. And we see this clinically all the time. If you even look at the second year as well, you'll see that they even have a drop, but it doesn't get as bad as the kids in the other two conditions. Clinically, for many teens with ADHD, the first quarter grades are as good as it gets. And after that, you're just hanging on for dear life to try to pass everything over the course of the year. And that's, uh, that's the pattern that we find. So we're not necessarily, in this study, we didn't improve grades, but we decreased or diminished the slide that is the common experience of teens with ADHD. So let's look for a minute at what's happening um, now in schools for students with emotional and behavior problems. This is a study of where they interviewed a lot of parents of students who had LD, ED, speech language, intellectual disability, or OHI as their exceptionality. About 1,400 kids, ages 6 to 12, and you can see the things that are most frequently provided for these students with emotional and behavior problems. You probably could have guessed the first couple. The thing I always wonder about when I saw this is, how many students with emotional and behavior problems are referred for help because they just can't finish their tests on time? That is ridiculous. That isn't why they're referred. That isn't even the worst of their problems, yet that's the most common knee-jerk response for students with emotional and behavior problems. Uh, we did a study looking at actually coded actual IEPs and 504 plans with middle school students with ADHD and found something very similar, both with 504 plans and 
IEPs, the larger, most common thing provided, again, was extended time to just try to target that terribly uh, difficult problem of test completion. And then other kinds of uh, interventions that we did. What we saw was that a lot of the interventions or services that are provided by schools really involve essentially just expecting less of them. And so we were curious about that and we wanted to look a little farther and so we surveyed a group of high school teachers, some of them special education teachers and other of them general ed teachers, and we asked about their expectations for students with uh, ADHD. And what you can see here in these columns is that there are some pretty substantial differences. So students are expected to complete assignments at home. Only 50% of the special ed teachers have that expectation for their students when the ma vast majority of the gen ed teachers did. They're allowed to complete assignments at home. Homework is assigned in addition to classwork. Big differences there. Similar long-term assignments. If you're in special ed in high schools, you almost never give that. In, in gen ed classes, about a third of the time they're assigned. Here's another expectation reduction. Credit can be received after the due date. Credit can be received two to three days after the due date, or credit can be received before the end of the grading period. That's where the, the last one is where there's the biggest difference. And just even in sense of being responsible for your materials. Only and most gen ed teachers make them responsible. Most special ed teachers do not. I think this gets at a fundamental issue. There's of how we address the problems students with emotional behavior problems have. If, if you look at this figure here, the blue line is our expectations for students. And the green line, or there is no green line, except on the key, of course. Uh, anyway, the light blue line <laughs> is how a child might be functioning. And so for uh, most children, or many children, they're functioning right in line with expectations, right? In this figure. So when they're doing their assignments, doing fine on their tests. Socially, they're meeting expectations, and behaviorally, they're meeting expectations. But when we have a student with emotional and behavior problems, often there's a gap between those things. The expectations, the age-appropriate expectations, are initially remain the same, and yet their performance is less than people expect of them, and hence, that's the definition of impairment, right? There's two, two points in impairment, what's expected and what they do. Well, one way to solve problems is just start expecting what they do. We can reduce our expectations, and the problem goes away. Impairment doesn't, magically doesn't exist anymore. And it's remarkably fast and easy because today I can expect you to do your homework, but you're failing my class because you never do your homework. Well, tomorrow we have a meeting about them, and I come back and say, I'm no longer going to expect you to do my your homework. And he says, great, because I'm not doing it. <laughs> and what do you know? His grade improves. We've fixed it. We've solved the problem, right? How long in life does that continue to operate? Only through schooling. Because an employer doesn't do that. A romantic partner hopefully doesn't do that. <laughs> you know, uh, police don't do that. You know, we expect, we have age appropriate expectations. One way to fix them is just eliminate that. On the other hand, here again is the gap, the impairment gap. And another approach is by improving the competencies of the student so they can meet those age appropriate expectations. Extended time is a reduction in expectations. Not expecting homework is a reduction in expectations. You can make every student succeed by reducing your expectations low enough, but it doesn't help them. In fact, I would argue it disables them further because it removes the incentive, the motivation, the need to do better. And we have services, we have interventions that you can do so they can come closer to those age expectations. But if you're not going to expect me to do my homework, I'm going to have nothing to do with an intervention that is going to help me get my work done because I don't need to. They said I don't need to. And so you're further disabling them. So how do we know what works? And impairment's a function of two things. 
It's the competencies, as we said, of the individual and the expectation of the setting. And we could do, take two approaches. We could improve the ability of the child to meet age-appropriate expectations. We could do that behaviorally, training, academic remediation, medications, any number of ways. Or we can simply reduce the expectations. Part of the problem is improving competencies takes more work and it's longer. And if you're busy scheduling and don't have time to do much, you can, the easiest thing to do is to reduce expectations. However, um, in the long run, that's not going to make a difference. So if we only measure whether an outcome works by does it fix the problem, we're, go we're too going to be too tempted to accept or believe that lowering expectations is effective. However, the, I think the better uh, metric to use to determine if an intervention is expected or effective in schools is to enhance the skills or look at does it enhance the skills of the student to independently meet age appropriate expectations for academics, interpersonal, and vocational funding. Not funding, functioning. Um, if it does those things, this is the first key. If you're measuring what you do by that standard, you have a much better chance to make meaningful, important, and substantial changes for students with emotional and behavior problems. And I think it's going to take some work to shift what we do in schools away from the reducing expectations and more to the improving competencies. And I think that's an important point. There were a group of us who worked on coming up with the wording of this enhancing the skills statement. And that led to us coming up with this model for looking at in schools and outside of schools, but in care all around, what is, how should we sequence interventions for students? And if we prioritize that enhancing the skills is the key, then we came up with this life course model. I don't have time to go too far into it, but it essentially means focusing on foundation strategies first, to looking at what are things in the environment that could be make an intervention difficult to implement because it could be chaotic home, chaotic classroom, whatever. Psychosocial interventions, many of them have the best shot, I think, at making a difference in improving competencies to make age appropriate expectations. Medications can sometimes do the same. They're less that way because it requires that you keep taking the medication. Therefore, it's not as independent as potentially a psychosocial intervention could be. And last, we put accommodations as defined by those reductions in expectations. And to me, it, it's different than I was trained as a special educator to think about how to intervene with students. However, it, it makes so, so much more sense in school mental health to have this focus. For example, we, we would find it absurd in this example to start with accommodations. For example, if a there is somebody who has a serious back injury and is confined to a wheelchair. It is wonderful that we have accommodations in our environment for that person to get around the wheelchair, ramps uh, to enter buildings, cut out curbs so people can cross the streets, and other accommodations. However, if there was a non-risky surgery that could correct the problem, in other words, increase that person's competency to function as they would want, we would find it silly to just stick with accommodations. You would have the surgery. You would do the intervention to improve the competency. However, in school, we, we don't, that isn't as obvious for some reason. My, I think the, actually all in services from all four of these layers, and we can go into it later uh, maybe, are important and can be interwoven and can be sequenced in ways that can be helpful. But if all you're really doing for a student with any emotional and behavior problem is solely accommodations, you're essentially saying, I'm giving up on this student. I'm, it's not worth providing the interventions that can help him or her function better. I'm just going to lower the expectations, and then he'll get through. And that's, I think, an unfortunate session, uh, statement or position. So. The key, the first key to success, I told you I was going to spend most of the time talking about and have, and that's to provide effective school mental health services. We really need to prioritize services that help students independently meet age-appropriate expectations. And I think that's 
uh, really key. There are, however, two other um, keys to success. And one of them I'm going to give you a little bit of data on for you to figure out. So we had five outcome measures in this study we did on the Challenging Horizons program. And then we wanted to see amongst this list of things, which of them predicted the best outcomes. And was, were the kids who took medication most likely to be successful? Were those where the counselors thought they had a good relationship the ones most likely to be successful? Look over that list and in your own head, just pick out one or two that you think probably was most associated with having a good outcome. And then I'll share the data with you. So the first two that weren't related to any of the five outcomes was the counselor's rating of relationship with students. As adults, we tend to think we do better with that off sometimes than we really do, and that uh, tended to not predict anything. Oppositional and defiant behavior also wasn't associated positively or negatively with any of the outcomes. Taking another step, students with ADH using ADHD medication actually on one of the five outcomes, there was a relationship. Those using the meds were more likely to have a better response. Um, symptoms of anxiety we're having were associated with a better response on one outcome, and gender was kind of mixed. It was unclear. But if you look at the final results, how many of you had picked these as the ones most associated with the most outcomes? Hopefully many. Um, dose, so the more of the program that they got, the better they did. Parent conflict, the more parent-adolescent conflict was in the home, the more, less responsive the student was. And the one that was associated with four out of the five outcomes was the student rating of the relationship with the counselor. So it wasn't that the counselor thought there was a good relationship. What mattered is, did the student think there was a good relationship? And to me, that's the second key, is that relationship. And the way I think about this and often convey it uh, to students when we're training in, in school mental health and clinical skills is to just think about yourself as if you were, as a clinician, as an island. And similarly, the student is an island. Maybe a little rockier of an island than yours, but the student is another island. And you, your goal, and this second key, is you want to build a bridge. You want to build a relationship between the islands, right? That probably needs to precede any active or uh, sophisticated intervention. You need to build that relationship. Because it's that relationship that provides the conduit for the interventions. It, without the relationship, the delivery of the interventions from your island to the student's island isn't going to make it. It's going to be empty. The kid will be less responsive. Why should I care? I don't like that person anyway. So it's important to have that bridge established as a conduit for which you can deliver the interventions. Now, of course, there has to be boundaries on your relationship. They can't be coming over every evening or things like that. You need professional relationships, so the bridge isn't always open for communication. Similarly, you can't just build a relationship and forget about it. You got to maintain your relationship. If you don't maintain your relationship and the bridge gets in disrepair, you can't put interventions across it anymore. It will be an ineffective conduit for what you're trying to accomplish, so you need to maintain it. You also need to pace the interventions. If you try to accomplish too much at once, nothing gets across. And so, hence the importance of maintaining and having that bridge and pacing what you provide and what you put across it. So the interventions that we talked about that are going across the bridge is key one. And that is you need things that are going to enhance the competencies of that student to meet age appropriate expectations socially, academically, and behaviorally. Second, and what you actually need to start with, is that relationship to give you a, a, a mechanism by which to get those interventions from your island to the student's island and to make a difference. And the third key, well, for which I don't have any data, but it comes with a strong recommendation as well, is you need to take care of yourself. 
because <laughs> as we, this is stressful work. Making a difference, it's why many people back away from this work and prefer to schedule. It's hard, and we fail sometimes, and we don't, and it's, we can't build a bridge with somebody who won't let a, the bridge be built. And yet we're trying so hard, and we think we're pretty good at this, but it's not working. And then setbacks happen, and crises happen. And if we're not doing things to take care of ourselves, to maintain our own peace of mind and our own uh, competency, then problems develop on our island, and at that point, we can't maintain the bridge. It all falls apart. So three keys, the relationship, the student cares what you think, the student cares about your opinion, and all of you know, who've, especially if you've worked with teens, they are not going to necessarily tell you that. <laughs> But they need to feel it. They need to believe it. They, they may verbally say terrible things, but they keep showing up, and they keep listening, and they keep working with you sometimes. Sometimes is actually a good amount for a lot of teenagers, so uh, let alone younger kids as well. Interventions, we can't just fix the problem. We've got to improve the competencies. And we've got to work towards a long-term goal of improving the competencies of this student, not so he just gets through sixth grade, but so he gets better prepared to be an independent adult and make uh, life decisions and, that are effective for him. And third, we need to take care of ourselves and each other. And without doing, I should say it the other way, by doing these three things, I think we maximally take advantage of all the uh, strengths of doing school mental health services and can make a difference for students that far exceeds historically what's been done for them, either in schools, clinics, or elsewhere. So um, I want to end by just saying that uh, I, I've, since I was a special ed teacher, even when that clinical psychologist showed up, I still believe that the kind of collaboration and focus on school mental health care is the best way to make a difference for students. And I want to wish all of you the best with your bridges. Thank you. Good morning. I ah. don't have a question, but I would like to hear um, your take on what I find happens. Here's the kid, fix it. I got to teach, uh, you know, or here's the kid. Yeah. Fix him and bring him back when he's fixed. And, um, and the investment in time being, not really being recognized as an important piece. Yeah, I think you, you brought up a couple points, uh, that Im important points. One is, to what extent is the work it takes to do what I just was talking about appreciated? Or do administrators care about it? Or do they just keep piling on your plate because all you're doing is seeing a few kids? And I, I don't have, a, obviously, a, a, fortunately it wasn't a question because as you said, it wasn't a question. I don't have a great answer other than we need to educate be, more than just us about this. We need to educate our administrators about this. We need to educate school boards and communities about this approach to making a difference in schools for kids with emotional behavior disorders, because it's not going to be appreciated a lot of times by people whose priorities aren't that. And many times, unfortunately, that can be our supervisor or administrator. Other times it is, but I, I believe that Many of you went into this field for the same reasons that I did, and that is the reward that we feel when we see that we've helped a student come from here to here is the reward we're seeking. It's why we do this work. And, some, and we've got to accept the uh, reality that that reinforcement, that reward for our work is going to have to be enough a lot of times. And that's got to be what propels us and keeps us going. The here, fix this kid approach 
is a common approach, and it's actually not just a school mental health approach, it's an approach at clinics too. The, drop off their kid, I'll pick him up in an hour, how many times do I have to do that before he's fixed? And that, that I uh, again, no easy answer other than we need to educate society and school professionals and clinical professionals about how, what this really looks like. You can't just fix these things. And it, that means the kid is broken and you just somehow could repair it like you do a car. That, uh, Unfortunately, it's a reality that you're going to keep facing in the setting, but it's also one that we need to power through and educate others about why that's unrealistic, even when they're not interested in that perspective. So I certainly appreciate and understand the frustration. Hi. Um, my question is related to the IEP. I work specifically with students with emotional behavioral disabilities. There's a group in here that do that. Um, regarding extended time handing in assignments, especially in high school, teachers do not like to give extended time, even mm -hmm. though I say, well, it's federal law, it's in the IEP. How do you suggest working with that issue? That they don't like to do it? Mm -hmm. um, well, first, I would, I would do, say that if you're going to encourage uh, extended time, not just on tests, although parents often want it for tests, uh, but... No, it's more assignments. It is, yeah. So allowing assignments to be late, essentially, without penalty. I would say if you're going to do that, which is a reducing an expectation, that's fine, but in addition to that, there should be a time limit on that reduced expectation. And in that time, you're doing organization interventions for time management and materials management so that after two months or if the child hits a certain mastery level, that expectation can return to normal. And things have to be in on time just like they are for every other student. And if you dovetail those two together, for some teachers, granted not all, it's more palatable to do it if I know it's a short-term adjustment as opposed to doing it uh, you know, for the rest of the school year and making it the only approach that we take with the, the child. Uh, I certainly understand, too, there are going to be teachers who aren't going to want to do it even for a short period of time. Nevertheless, uh, again, that, I'll just go back to that's part of educating them about the process. And in, <coughs> interventions that improve competencies take time, and we don't want the child failing before he achieves mastery of the intervention and therefore doesn't need the accommodation anymore. And so it, it's a time-limited basis. And then report back every few weeks, how is the child doing in terms of getting closer to mastery and therefore removing that adapted inner, uh, expectation. And just to piggyback on that, in, I don't know if it's more in high school or not, the uh, online assignments a lot of times are time-sensitive. Right. They just disappear, and yeah. the teachers don't know how to adjust it to right. give them an extra day. Yep. That's, a, that's an issue that I'm seeing more and more this year. That, that is a practical issue, yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't, uh, the only thing that comes to mind is give a paper alternative. Uh, but again, sometimes that's not very uh, desirable for teachers either. They don't like the extra Because then they have to grade that. They don't have to grade the online one. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. I, I have, in a sense, two, two comments. When you mentioned that session duration might be unlimited at the school, you know, we, we do experience the same testing pressures throughout. So if, if we want to be, uh, have a good relationship with the teachers, I am very sensitive of not keeping a child out of a classroom. Yeah. So, I, I just don't see that session durations are unlimited. And, and the second point that I want to make, for those who, of us who had the opportunity to hear Trump uh, last night, he mentioned this whole idea of, and, and by the way, the Cruz example, I, I find to be a textbook example because of failures at all levels. But specifically, you know, he mentioned this idea of bringing the, of, of putting um, handicapped individuals back into 
mental health institutions. And I'm bringing it out because I want all of us to be aware. So whereas we know that even, in other words, when community mental health centers were, were, were being shut down, there were some good results of, of, of that crisis where people are then able more and more to receive services locally. So did you hear that? Do you have any things, in other words, do we need to ramp it up and send these young people into institutions or, or, or do we need to treat them locally at the schools? Thank you. Well, uh, you brought up two things. The second one, I don't have enough time to talk about, but I'll ad address briefly. Uh, the first one is duration of sessions. Yes, and I may have been misleading there. There's, fl there's flexibility in how, the, how long a, in, uh, an intervention or how long I can see a child on a given day. But we've put, especially in middle and high schools, um, where I think the scheduling problems are worse. You know, we've found different classes to pull them from. We've eat, eaten lunch with the students. Uh, a lot of times at high schools, a lot of, they're all lined up outside the building because they were dropped off by the bus waiting for the bell to ring to come in early, so we pulled them in early. It, it takes some creativity and, and things, but you can find those times often with most kids. What I was referring to was duration of over how long a period can you work with them. And you can work with them over a much longer period of time, like uh, First Step Next and the Challenging Horizons program. Those are long, potentially lo much longer interventions than you'd probably ever get away with at a clinic. In terms of should we send all these kids to institutions, I think we're probably all on the same page with how counterproductive that would be. Um, I, I think, well, I'm just going to stop there before I get caught up in addressing so many things <laughs> pertaining to that one. Okay, well, I think if, if people have any more questions, uh, there's a workshop in the afternoon uh, that they can, uh, and also uh, Dr. Evans will be around for, for lunch and coffee breaks as well. So, so thank you very much. Thank you.